This morning, uh, we are in part three of a series that we are calling uh, Invincible Church. And uh, we were actually set to conclude this series today. Uh, but as Connor and I have been talking, we've decided to add one more week to this. And so I'm going to lead us here uh, today. And then Conda will be back with us next Sunday uh, for the conclusion of this series. And you will not want to miss that. Well, I'll never forget um, on my 16th birthday, getting my Georgia driver's license. I mean, what an absolute thrill. I mean, you know, such a great, amazing moment. You know, it was uh, March in Georgia. It was spring, you know, just seven, eight years ago. Went, took my driver's test and uh, succeeded at passing that, you know, had been through the whole year of, of just uh, the, the learner's permit and driving with my parents and doing the whole year of, you know, mom slamming the brakes from the passenger seat and, you know, holding on. I'm like, you're freaking me out. If you would calm down, I would be fine. But just woo. So we went through that whole year and our relationship uh, grew as a result. And that was, that was awesome. And now finally, I had my Freedom, And uh, I'll never forget getting my driver's license that morning and then later that day, um, loading up uh, in uh, our 1984 full-size black uh, Chevy Blazer. I think we have a, a picture of it here. And was with my uh, younger brother. Man, this thing was a tank. It was awesome. And uh, I, was, I was just a boss driving around in this thing. And I'll never forget my mom kind of standing on the front steps, biting her fingernails nervously as my little brother and I loaded up and headed out to our maiden voyage to go cruise the strip down at Town Center Mall in Kennesaw, Georgia. And, you know, it was just so awesome, so exciting. And I just remember feeling like I was on top of the world. I mean, windows down, music up, having a blast. And I'd love to say that, you know, in those early years that I obeyed all of the traffic laws and that I was just a, you know, respectable young driver, but I didn't and I wasn't. I was actually kind of a punk behind the wheel in those early days, uh, a little bit of an idiot. And the reality was, is I felt invincible. Uh, I thought, here I am with this freedom and this newfound power and this unbelievable tank of a vehicle and I am invincible and no one can stop me. And I just absolutely loved it until one night. Uh, leaving a youth group event, I had the car loaded down with youth group friends and, um, you know, the, the laws about students and drivers and passengers and all those things were just a little bit looser. Uh, sorry, students of today, because of my generation, your things are a little bit tighter, but it's a good thing because we had people just loaded up in this car. I mean, like a sardine situation, people sitting on top of people, not enough seats, not enough seat belts, people sitting in the back, you know, where there were no seats. And um, we were just just cruising along and in some of my exploration, I had found this gravel road that uh, cut between one of my, my friend's houses and another neighborhood. And it was just this awesome place to go and drive down the gravel and fishtail around and, and just be awesome. And um, off this gravel road, they were starting to develop this neighborhood and it was kind of at this place where, you know, they were uh, grading the ground and there, there weren't really roads paved, but they had cleared it out and it was just all dirt and mud. And that night in particular, it was pouring rain. So it was super super muddy. So I did what every good Georgia boy does with the four-wheel drive loaded down with friends, and I took a mudden. I mean, that's what we did in Georgia. No G required on the end of that. It's M-U-D-D-I-N, mudden. That's what we did, and it was an absolute blast. And so we pull into this neighborhood, and we're peeling around and, uh, you know, people are just flying all over the place. And, whoa, whoa, whoa. and, you know, people in the back, not in seats, are just bouncing up and down. And they're screaming and laughing and, you know, egging me on, like, go faster. And I'm just spinning around and mud's flying everywhere. And the whole car's, like, getting covered up. And, you know, we're just having a blast. And I'm feeling, again, on top of the world, I'm feeling invincible. Well, my friends just keep going, oh, faster, spin it again, spin it again. Well, I get going on this straightaway. And I think, oh, I'm going to just crank this thing and just, it's, it's going to spin. It's going to be unbelievable. And it, it was because it, it, it unbelievably spun the vehicle off of the road and down a hill and the car hit a tree. Ooh, is right. 
mom and dad, if you ever hear this message, I'm super sorry. Like, they didn't find out about this, and I'm sure they will retroactively punish me severely. Um, because here's the miraculous thing no one was hurt, and th this tank of a vehicle walked away with a dent on the bumper. I mean, it just took this tree on and, you know, gave it a punch and hit right back. So, super fortunate on that front. But I remember that feeling of going from this invincible hero and two seconds later feeling like this irresponsible jerk. I mean, it went from laughing and screaming and yeah, 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 to girls crying in the background. <laughs> we almost died. And, you know, one of my friends is like just yelling at me like, you're an idiot. I'm like, you told me to do it. Like, what's your problem? And then, you know, it's like, all right, so we all calmed down. You know, everybody checked all the vitals. We were all good. And it's like, all right, well, let's get out of here. Well, then the car's kind of stuck. And again, it's pouring rain. It's super muddy. So I have to get all my friends out of the car and get them to help me push to get back up this hill to drive away. So now everyone's soaked and covered in mud and hated my guts. And so it was, it was just so, so, you know, fun and fortunate that, you know, no one was hurt. But I do just so specifically remember that moment driving home that night, that inevitable moment that almost all of us as, as teenagers or, or maybe as young college students at some point have that reality hit us of, ooh, maybe I'm not actually so invincible. Maybe I'm not actually untouchable. And we've all had that experience and we felt that in life where, where we feel like there are just certain things in life that are a sure bet, that are absolutely for sure, they're invincible, and yet then reality sort of sets in. Even Superman has his kryptonite. And we've experienced moments of maybe uh, pain or disappointment or, or loss, or we've connected with some of our own weakness and frailty and just had this realization and this question of, is anything actually really invincible? And we've just been hit with that reality. And, and yet Jesus, he counters that with a promise. In Matthew chapter 16, and, and in this verse, we are basing this series, this Invincible Church series, on these words from Jesus. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 18, on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades, the gates of hell, will not overcome. What Jesus is saying here in this, in this uh, moment, in, in this reality, in this time, I'm going to build this church, my church, on me. The rock he's speaking about is himself. And he's saying, in me, through me, through my perfect, sinless life, my death and my resurrection, I will launch my church. And I will do it in such a way that the forces of evil will never overcome it. My church will be invincible. And so in this series, we're exploring some of the ways and the very ways that we believe that Jesus designed his church to operate and to be invincible. And in his design, the church never has to slow down. It never has to stop. The church ought to never, ever die. And in this, we want to be faithful in examining our role. Now, we are just one church in one community and part of a much larger body of believers, not only in this community, but around the world. And yet we believe we have been gifted with this moment and it is our responsibility to steward our role in the larger story of the church. To step in line with the history of believers who have come before us, who have given their lives to trusting and following Jesus and loving and caring and nurturing the church. What are some of the components? What are the pieces? What are the ingredients needed for us to play our role well? Well, the first week, Kondo started us off, and we talked about leadership and its importance in the church. And we celebrated together some of the just amazing folks that the Lord has brought to, uh, to us and provided for us to help us lead this church. And yet we acknowledge that leadership has its place, and it is not about one person or a couple of people. Leadership is crucial, but leaders are replaceable. As Kondo shared a couple of weeks ago, the church's invincibility is tied to the dispensable nature of its leaders. If you have a necessary leader in place, then you have a vulnerable church. If you have dispensable leaders who understand that, 
then the church is postured to be invincible. Last week, we talked about life of the body and how the church put on this supernatural display of living open-handed and claiming nothing as their own. Their possessions didn't belong to them. Everything came from the Lord. It was the Lord. So they would give back to the Lord for his church, giving all they had, selling their possessions to meet the needs of the poor. A church that lives open-handed, looking out for the needs of others is primed to be an invincible church. And we looked at the commitment to testify on behalf of the gospel. What have you witnessed? What have you seen Jesus do? What have you seen Jesus do in your own life, in your own heart? Share it, get out there, testify on behalf of Jesus. You are here because someone shared with you. Who will you impact for the kingdom because you shared with them? A testifying church is an invincible church because it is always seeing new life. You can't kill something that's springing up new life. And so this week, I want to talk about light and its effect on our community. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to uh, Acts. We're going to go back again to these early believers, this early church in the book of Acts in the New Testament, Acts chapter 2. And Jesus, he's ascended to heaven. Uh, he, he's, he died on the cross. He rose from the dead, spent some time with his uh, followers, and he's ascended to heaven basically saying, hey, I'm going to go be with my father. I have some work to do up there to prepare a place for you, but you, you take this mission forward. You take the gospel forward to Jerusalem, to, Judea, to Judea, to the ends of the earth. You take this movement forward, and I'm going to send you help. I'm going to send you my Holy Spirit to guide you and to help lead you through this. And in the beginning of chapter 2, we see this, the, the coming of the Holy Spirit, and it's known as the day of Pentecost. And God moves in a really powerful way through the apostles and through the believers on that day. And amazing things happen. And then Peter just starts preaching this sermon of a lifetime. And it says that thousands were added to their number that day. And we're going to pick it up in verse 42. And if you were with us last week, this is going to sound a little bit familiar to some of the pieces that we saw in chapter 4. Acts 2, verse, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 2, verse 42 they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Again, we see this powerful picture of community. I mean, it is far more than just being together. It's a picture of unity. It's a picture of genuine love. Let's continue in verse 46. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Every day they met together in the temple courts. Every day they would, they would wake up and they would uh, travel from their homes into the temple courts. And this in and of itself is amazing because it speaks to their commitment and their desire and their willingness to testify on behalf of the gospel of Jesus. You see, in Jerusalem, the temple courts, that was the happening place. It was the epicenter of culture. This is where everything came together. And religion was a really, really big deal. And we see all throughout the scriptures in Jesus' ministry, there's this constant relationship with the temple and going in and the coming and going and what's happening and who's there and what is going on. And so this was the place to be. And we have to realize that these are Jewish Christians People who have been changed, their eyes and their hearts have been opened to the teaching and the way of Jesus. And they aren't necessarily abandoning their Jewishness as much as they are embracing this new way and walking into the capital of Jewish religion to testify that there is a better new way to God. You see, previous to Jesus, 
the Jews were set up on this old covenant, the covenant that God gave to Abraham and then handed down through Moses. And it was this way and this set of laws and, and these really intricate rules and what it meant to connect with God and to be right with God. And there was foreshadowing all throughout the old covenant of a coming Messiah. And so the Jews were perched and looking and ready for this Messiah. And yet what they were looking for is for this king to come in on a mighty horse and to come and to overthrow the Roman empire and to completely liberate and free them. So when Jesus comes as this humble Jewish carpenter, he is largely missed. And so the majority of the population is operating in the old covenant. And they're at the temple doing their business with God and with the priest and their sacrifices. And these Jewish believers, followers of the way of Jesus are coming in and they're holding out this new covenant and they're walking in to say, hey, the the Messiah actually did come. And he's freed me and he's done an amazing work in my life. And there's a new way, there's a new reality and what it looks like to connect with God. Jesus didn't come to abolish the old way, but to complete it. And he did it. There's a new way. And I cannot even imagine the nerve wracking reality. It must have been for them to walk into the temple courts every day in this tension. These were not foreigners. We haven't gotten to the part of the story where the gospel is going out into the rest of the world, Jerusalem, Judea, the rest of the earth. No, we're still in the part of the story that it is very much in Jerusalem. This isn't a a short-term mission trip moment where they can get on a plane and connect with people that they've never met before and in 10, 12 days they can go home and maybe never see these people again. No, these are the natives of Jerusalem, embracing an entire new system of beliefs and walking into the hotbed of their hometown to tell their family and their friends and their neighbors about it. I'm sure that was tense. I'm sure there was a lot of nerves around that. Earlier, just a few moments ago, Emily asked you to stand up and to pray with some of someone. And I bet for some of us, our our heart rate is still coming down a little bit from that moment. I'd love to see like the Fitbit reports of the heart rates, like right then and there, just like, like everybody just, oh my gosh, I got to go talk to somebody, pray to somebody. And we did that because we want to be in practice of, of meeting each other and greeting each other and being together and what it means to walk in fellowship and praying for each other. And we also want to be practicing and warming ourselves up for what it means to walk into our community with good news, with a new way, with hope. And I realize that's a nerve wracking thing my neighborhood, this town, oh man, put me on a plane, send me somewhere. Please, please, please. I mean, I'll write a check. I can write a check. I can do that. I can make cookies. I can do whatever. But going around my community, and what I imagine is if we could connect with these early believers and get inside their heads and their hearts, I imagine the conversation would be something like this. As they're walking to the temple courts, what if I see somebody I know? What what if I freeze up? What if I don't have the answer? What if one of these religious leaders comes and confronts me and says, well, what about this? And what about this? And I'm thinking, I don't know. I'm not sure, but I know that Jesus has done something new in me. What if I mess the whole thing up? What if I get rejected? What if my family and friends hear about this thing and they're like, whoa, you've gone a little crazy with the whole Jesus thing. You need to back off. If I get rejected, I get pushed away. What what if I just don't have the answers? I imagine that we could find some points to connect and relate. See, testifying in your own community, that is hard work. It's risky. It takes guts. It takes faith. It takes trust. I was with this group of people this week, and this woman was sharing this just really incredible, inspiring story. 
And I just asked her a simple follow-up question. Hey, how did all that start? And she didn't hesitate. Jesus. It was only through Jesus that this was possible. I can tell you I didn't have the strength, but it was Jesus in me. And it was just so stunning and refreshing to me that right then and there in the middle of all these people, she was willing and ready to testify on behalf of what Jesus had done in her. And these early believers, they met in the temple courts every day. Why? To testify of what Jesus had done in their lives. And because they were faithful in that work, the church has continued on for generation after generation after generation, intent on claiming Jesus' promise that nothing can stop his church. Let's continue. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God. We see people on mission and in community together. They went to the temple courts to testify, and then they just went and got together to go eat, which I love that. They they enjoyed each other. They were glad to be together. And and we saw in the early verses, the earlier verses, they were postured to to just give and to open their hands and to fill needs. What do you need? What can we do? How can we help? And they praised God for all he was doing. And check out these next words. And enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. They took care of each other, took care of the poor. They devoted themselves to God's word and prayer. They went to the courts daily to testify. They loved and enjoyed each other. They loved and praised God. And they enjoyed the favor of all the people. It's as if the early church was actually good news to its community. And if we need further proof of that, we see that in the next line. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Who added the number of people being saved? The Lord. God did that. God does that. That, That's his job. It's in his spirit that eyes and hearts are open to the truth and the hope found in the gospel of Jesus. I, I have never saved anyone's soul and I never will. It's not my job. My job, your job, the, the church's job is to reflect light and the glory of God in a dark and dying world around us. So let's, let's talk about light just a little bit. Uh, a few passages quickly. First Peter chapter two, verse nine. But you are a chosen people. Those of you who have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, those who have trusted Jesus with your life, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Take a moment and just let those first words soak in and take root. You're a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood. In Jesus, you are a holy nation. You are God's special possession. Listen to the value. Listen to just the desire that God has to say, listen, listen. In Christ, through Christ, you're a big deal. You are my chosen people, a royal priesthood. We've talked for a couple of weeks about this idea of decentralization and and decentralizing the church, about the church not being about a leader or a couple of leaders, but about a body of believers who are walking together in unity of spirit. Your royal priesthood. There's your credentials right there. If you've ever been in a situation and you're walking with Jesus and you're thinking, I need a pastor, look in the mirror. You are God's chosen people. You are a royal priesthood. And God has pulled you out of darkness so that you would declare his praises. But he's the source. He called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. He is the source. The light comes from him. 
In case we're fuzzy on, on how this works, take a look up into the sky the next couple of nights. There's a full moon tomorrow night. And you know and I know when, when the moon is, is full and bright, you can go outside and yeah, it's, it's dark. I mean, when the sun goes down and it is, it's dark, but yet when the moon is, is positioned and it's bright and it's full, there's enough light to see through the darkness. And yet there is not one watt of illumination being generated by the moon. Not one. It is merely reflecting a complete reflection of the sun's power and light. And when the moon is positioned properly, it does a pretty good job of showing off the power and the light of the sun. And I love how God does that. You're struggling with, with where you fit in as a believer in a, in a dark world? Look up in the sky and take cue from the big rock that's hanging over our heads, reflecting light from the sun. It's showing off what we are to do as Christ followers. Reflect the light for all the world to see. If you've trusted Jesus with your life, you're a chosen people and God has called you out of the darkness into his light. Let's look at Matthew chapter five. This is Jesus speaking to his followers. Verse 14, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its own stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. What the early church in Acts knew is that they needed to shine some light so that people would have the opportunity to experience God in a new and powerful way. And yes, it is so critical for us as believers to, to love each other and, and to take care of each other and to look out for each other. Jesus makes that very clear. He, he says, they're gonna know you. They're gonna know that you're my disciples in the ways that you love each other. That, that's how they're gonna identify who you are. So that's a really important part. And yet, if those early believers had just stayed isolated in their community, if they were only committed to going to each other's homes and breaking bread and eating together and enjoying each other and laughing together and, and worshiping God together, well, well, that would have been nice. But that would have risked keeping the light hidden and under a bowl and contained. And Jesus says, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't hide your light. Don't keep it to yourselves. Get out there and share it so people can see and experience the good news and the hope that I have for them. So these early believers, they loved each other. They loved God and they faithfully went into the temple courts and shined some light. And daily the Lord added to their numbers those who were being saved. Listen, if the, if the church threatened to shut down. As if Mission Point. If Mission Point threatened to shut down, let's, let's say we, we, we came here next week and we started off and then we did announcements and we said, hey, just want to let you know, um, this is our last week and um, next week we're not going to be here. Would the community care? Would the county care? Would the people of Kosciuszko rise up and have a bit of a fit and say, no, 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 no. You, you, you can't shut down. You, you, you can't shut the doors. We need you. You're just too important to the community and what's going on around here. We, we need you. I mean, we may not agree with everything you say, and we might roll our eyes just a little bit when you come and knock on our doors. But listen, we, we need you. You can't shut down. The early church, if it had shut down, it would have been absolutely missed. The, the community there cared. The poor, the sick, women who were treated as far less than, people who were overlooked or underprivileged. 
They cared about the church because the church was notorious for intentionally carving out paths and carrying care to the hurting. We are the light of the world. And the world should notice when the light gets turned off. Light is the thing that counteracts darkness. It's the thing that makes the burdens lighter. And that's what the early church majored in. It was this idea of living in community and and operating as a body of believers and just going around and looking for opportunities to lift burdens, to reflect light and lift burdens. What can we do? How can we help? And as a result, the community valued the church's presence and they enjoyed the favor of all the people. We want to be a place that leads not with the things that we are against, but the things that we are for. That there's a lot of people who will quickly hold up for you the things that they are against and the things they will stand against. But we want to be about the things that we are for and what we are for is Jesus. We are for Jesus and we are for people. And we exist to invite everyone everywhere to life in Christ. And what that simply means is as a body of believers, we want to be experiencing this life in Christ, this vibrant, unbelievable, life-giving, hope-giving life in Christ. And then we want to connect with people and we want to introduce the two. And any point we can bring that intersection together, we want to do that. We want to be experiencing and living life in Christ. And we want to be going out and connecting and meeting people and saying, hey, have you met our friend? Have you met our Savior, Jesus? We want people to know that we are for them. And ultimately, we believe that God is for them. And in Jesus, there's a whole new way. And as a church, we want to do this better and better as the world gets darker and darker. And every month we're going to present a new love op, another opportunity for you to step out and and to get out into the community and shine some light in a really practical, tangible, simple way. And, And throughout the year, we will. We're gonna interact with the sick and the poor and the forgotten and the underprivileged. And our desire as a, as a leadership team, is to facilitate and to set the stage for you to step up into a moment of what it means to share the light. And just with just a little bit of leadership and a little bit of guidance and encouragement, you would have that opportunity to reflect some light. But if we want to be serious about what it means to reach the thousands and thousands of people in our county who have not experienced Jesus and do not have a relationship with him or with the local church, Love Ops alone is not going to cover it. We have to step outside of some of our gatherings and we have to make this personal. This has to be something that we carry with us on a daily basis. Obviously, we don't get together every day and march into the temple courts together. That, that's not our world. That's not our reality. But individually, We march into our own epicenters of culture, our own areas of influence, our own areas and circles and groups of people. Areas of darkness that need light. And we have to begin to take this personally. And like the early believers who marched into the temple courts every day, we need to be marching into our lives with this kind of intentionality of what can I do to share light? And I realize this can feel like a lot. And this feeling of, uh, where, where do I start? So, so as we wrap up here in our last few moments, I, I want to look at just a really quick story and, and make one observation from it. And it's the next chapter, Acts chapter 3, verse 1. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at 3 in the afternoon. Now, a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. 
Peter looked straight at him, as did John. And then Peter said, look at us. And the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. And then Peter said, silver, gold, I do not have. But what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Going to church, giving your life to Jesus, getting involved in a community of believers, those are big, important steps. And we get so excited every time we hear about ways in which people are taking those steps. Being light and darkness so that your community can see and experience God, taking that to a very personal level, well, that can be overwhelming. And that can feel hard. So let's take a really simple cue from Peter. Silver or gold I do not have. But what I do have, I give you. As we find needs in our community, as we come across things and we hear stories and we see situations, we, we may look at some of those things and, and we may not have silver or gold or whatever that situation requires. But we can do something. We can reach out in some way. We can give what we do have. We will do for you what we can do. And maybe it's helping people connect with another person or an opportunity or helping them with counseling or, or whatever the case may be. Or maybe it is some financial things or it's some training or some resources. I don't know, but whatever it is, if we can help meet a need, let's do that. We may not be able to fix everything. In fact, I'm sure of it. We cannot fix everything. But what we will do, we can. One of the most liberating and inspiring things I often heard Pastor Andy Stanley say is, do for one what you wish you could do for the many. Do for one what you wish you could do for the many. And what I love about this place is I know that I'm sitting in a room full of just unbelievable, generous people who step up when they find out and they hear about needs. People with huge hearts who desire to go out and to be the change and to shine some light. And yet it can be really overwhelming when we talk about thousands and thousands of people and what do we do and where do we start and what about the needs all across the world? Do for one what you wish you could do for many. As I've shared in here before, um, we are a, a licensed foster home and um, have been for a number of years. We, we started that back in Georgia and then got certified when we got here. And right now we don't have a placement. In fact, we haven't had a, a placement for a little while. And when we got started in this thing, it was just this overwhelming thing to me of looking at this, this need in our community at the time and just feeling so overwhelmed of like, I, I, don't, I, I don't know what we can do. I, I don't feel like we can do all this and, and handle all this. And, and Erica you know, like she often does, just had this clarity of, of vision. And, and she's like, I think we just need to do it. I think we just need to take a step. And the Lord led me to that place of saying, okay, let's take a step. And so we went and we got our, our license. And right away, we started getting placements. And, and we just started taking things on and, and, you know, multiple kids. And we went through seasons of respite and doing other things. And we had seasons that were terrible and went really poorly and things that were hard and overwhelming. And, and we just started to learn and realize what we could do, what we could handle. And we had an opportunity to foster one boy for almost six months. And it was just an unbelievable thing that God used to do amazing work in the ways that he changed and moved us. And there were a bunch of kids and things and situations that we've had to say no to and situations that we've had to say, I don't think we can do that. And yet we, we, can, we can help the one. And it takes a while to, to, to get comfortable in that and just the reality of, hey, I'm not God. 
I'm not the Savior, and neither are you. So do for one what you wish you could do for the many, and then watch and see how God opens up the resources and the help and the encouragement and the support. And maybe he leads you to other things and to bigger things and to different things. But in your season of life, wherever you are, you can do something. You can enter in and you can meet some kind of need. If you're walking in light and you are living with open hands, looking for opportunities, I promise you will find them. And when you do, just do what you can. Personally, we want to be light bringers and, and miracle workers and, and ask as we find situations, what practical burden can we begin to help and relieve? And, and we may not perform miracles in, in the vivid sense like we, we saw here with Peter and John, but whenever we help reverse some of the curse and we press into some of the darkness and we shine light and we begin to lighten the burden, we become the miracle to the person who cannot reverse their own misfortune. When we're faithful at representing Jesus in dark places, we are the miracle to those who are desperate for hope. Some of you can testify to that end in your own life. You were at your wit's end when the Lord sent light and hope to you through someone else. And that's how the early church ended up enjoying the favor of all the people and seeing the Lord do the work that only he can do and adding to their numbers daily those who were being saved. And I believe they weren't just marching into the temple courts to preach, but to look for needs. How can we help? What can we do? And when we're faithful to play our part, God will step in and do the miraculous life-changing work that only he can do. A church that acts like the hands and feet of Jesus in its community will never die. It's an invincible church because Jesus will never stop showing up where he is being represented. Next Sunday, um, you'll not want to miss out. Kondo, as I said, will we'll be here to wrap up our series, part four of the Invincible Church, and we'll... Uh, celebrate the breaking of bread and communion together. And then later in the afternoon, we'll go out into the community on this prayer up. And again, I just want to encourage you one more time to please consider joining us. Um, when you leave here in just a moment, when I pray, uh, there's gonna be sign-up tables in the lobby. You can go out to the left and just as you go to the right out the doors, you'll see those tables there stop. And they have the neighborhoods listed out. You can sign up for one area, one community. They'll get you in touch with one of the leaders and, and a time to meet up and to go pray just for an hour next Sunday from four to five. And, and we would love to begin to just continue this faithful journey and work of stepping out and bringing just a little bit more light to areas of darkness. So as we go, may we see the opportunities all around us to love God, to love people, and to share some light. Let me pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this church and this body and the privilege it is to be together. And Lord, I am so grateful to be sitting in a room of people who I just see so repeatedly caring for each other and loving each other well. So God, now I, I pray that you would Move in us, provide the courage and the trust and the faith we need to take some of this love and some of this care further into our community, further into the dark places that need light. Lord, we know the opportunities are already there. Lord, we know that you are with us. You've promised that. Lord, we proclaim that you're responsible for all the results and all the work of heart change. So Lord, I pray that you would find us faithful in the task of going out and just reflecting light and lifting burdens and doing what we can and trusting you for the rest. In Christ's name, amen.